Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Elizabeth Gessel, and I am the Director of Public Programs at Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. MOAD is a contemporary art museum, and our exhibitions and programming inspire learning through the global lens of the African diaspora. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the challenging circumstances we are all in, and I hope everyone in the audience today is safe and healthy. MOAD stands in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. We honor and mourn the senseless murders of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, and Walter Wallace. We grieve for so many others who have lost their lives at the hands of state-sanctioned violence and racial injustice, including those whose names we do not know. As this list continues to grow, MOAD will continue to say their names as our commitment to honoring the victims and to attaining true racial justice is unwavering. As many of us are settlers, immigrants, or descendants of those forcefully brought to this continent, our institutions were founded upon exclusions and erasures of the indigenous peoples on whose land we are located. With deep respect, MOAD acknowledges that even in virtual space, we reside on unceded native lands and thank the indigenous people of the Bay Area who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. Today, I welcome you to MOAD Online and our series, Conversations Across the Diaspora, occurring monthly with guests from all over the globe. Some you may recognize and some you may not, but all will bring a new perspective to the African diaspora. Thank you to our host, Sarah Ladipo Manika, who is generously volunteering her time and her brilliance for this series. I want to acknowledge Peggy Woodford Forbes for helping to support conversations across the diaspora and thank you to everyone here who has joined us today with special appreciation for those who have donated to the museum during this pandemic. We would not be able to produce this programming without your support. Today's program is presented in partnership with Litquake and with Poets and Writers, and we are grateful for their collaboration. Moad is thrilled to be presenting a conversation with poet, essayist, and playwright Claudia Rankin. I will introduce our host, who will then introduce our esteemed guest. Sarah Ladipo Manika was raised in Nigeria and has lived in Kenya, France, Zimbabwe, and England. Sarah is a novelist, short story writer, essayist, and founding books editor for Aussie.com. Her debut novel, Independence, is an international bestseller, while her second novel, Like a Mule Bringing Ice Cream to the Sun, has been translated into a number of languages. Her nonfiction includes personal essays and intimate profiles of people she meets, from Mrs. Harris and Pastor Evan Mawurere to Toni Morrison, Margaret Busby, and Michelle Obama. Sarah serves, or previously served on Moad, MOAD's board and currently serves as board director for the Women's Writing Residency Hedgebrook. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. And thank you to all in the audience. We can't see you, but we know that you're there. Many of you have been coming from the very beginning and just coming every month. It's great to see all of you coming back again. And I want to give a quick shout out to the legendary Margaret Busby, who happens to be in the audience. And a quick shout out particularly to you because you are the genius behind New Daughters of Africa, in which both Claudia and I are honored to have pieces. Claudia Rankin, I am so excited to be in conversation with you. Thank you so much for coming. And I'm going to just quickly formally introduce you. Um, Claudia Rankin is the author of six collections of poetry, including Citizen, an American Lyric, and Don't Let Me Be Lonely, several plays, including The White Card and Provenance of Beauty, a South Bronx travelogue, as well as numerous video collaborations. Her most recent publication, Just Us, An American Conversation, is a powerful collection of essays, poems, and images. Rankin is also the editor of several anthologies, including The Racial Imaginary, Writers on Race and the Life of the Mind. In 2016, she co-founded the Racial Imaginary Institute, and among her numerous awards and honors, Rankin is the recipient of the Bobbitt National Prize for Poetry, the poet and writer's Jackson Poet and Writers Jackson Poetry Prize, and fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Lannan Foundation, the MacArthur Foundation, United States Artists, and the National Endowment of the Arts. She is Chancellor of the Academy of American Poets 
and teaches at Yale University as the Frederick Eisman Professor of Poetry. Claudia, welcome. Thank you, Sarah. It's such an honor to be here with you. It's great to have you. Uh, Claudia, so many awards. Have you got a favorite? A favorite. Or one that really surprised <laughs> you? All your honors and your fellowships? Um, what an uh, interesting question. I, a favorite award, I never, I don't actually, I think they're all surprises. So I have a lot of surprise awards. <laughs> um, but no, um, you know, it's just always a, a surprise that um, people are actually engaging the work. You know, as a writer that you spend a lot of time by yourself um, going down avenues, trying to make a thing and, and then it goes out in the world and finds its people. And I try not to be too invested in either the awards or the um, the rejections because, you know, I feel like once it's out, it's out. It's interesting that you bring up the word rejection because I think, you know, people will probably look at you and think rejection. Have you had any rejections? Has anyone said no to your work? <laughs> and it's many people. Claudia, we always start these programs off by asking our guests about their connection to the African diaspora. Can you tell us about your particular connection? Well, I think um, there are ways to think about it as a immigrant to the United States. Certainly I come from a country, Jamaica, that was colonized by the British, so, you know, and, and we know how the slave routes went, so we know that the connection is across the continents. Um, but also in terms of my writing, I would say that some of the most important um, critics for me and writers are people like um, Césaire or um, Fano. Fano being maybe um, the most important thinker in the ways in which his um, work intersects with the psychological ramifications of anti-Blackness within a society. I think you started off, if I'm remember, remembering correctly, Citizen with a quote from Aimé Césaire um, in which that quote where I don't, to paraphrase, life is sort of not a spectator sport, I think, mm -hmm. um, so. and just really powerful. Um, so you grew up in Jamaica for the first few years of your life. And I'm just wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your childhood and perhaps what kindled some of your love for literature, for the arts. Well, you know, I, I, my mother tells a story. I, <laughs> I'm gonna believe her, but she said um, out the shoot, I was, one of those kids who's reading even before I could read. So, you know, um, so I would be holding books. So obviously I must have been around readers, people who had books. Um, but I, you know, once I came to the United States when I was about six or seven, I, I spent a lot of time in the library. I'm one of those kids where the library was my closest friend. And I, um, I would go to the library with bags of, you know, like bags with handles and come home full of books all by the same author. I read, I just read alphabetically in the library. <laughs> and when I finished all the books by one author, I went on to all the books by the next author. And I, the thing that I remember most in retrospect was I read all of those books that are called, um, you know, best American plays from 1945, best American plays from 1946, best American, and equally the short stories, best American short stories. So whenever I watched a movie, I always knew the plot. <laughs> <laughs> like, How do you know what's gonna happen? 
Well, it's, it's interesting going back to what you said about your mother saying that, you know, you started reading before you could read. Um, for me, that's almost perhaps metaphorical, you know, the ways in which you read, the ways in which you read situations, the ways in which you read conversations. So that's quite interesting. Maybe we'll, we'll get to a little bit more of that when we talk about your latest book. But um, I want to go to Citizen, which is sort of the middle book of your, the, this latest trilogy. Um, the book is entitled Citizen, and one of the fundamental rights of a citizen is the right to vote. So given where we are in America at this point in time, what reflections would you make on what it means to be a citizen, an American citizen at this time? Well, I think, you, um, I think you're absolutely right that the right to vote is really at the center of our power as, as citizens. And we know that because uh, how, of how active voter suppression is in this country. Um, right now, the unwillingness to concede has to do with an attempt to delegitimize one vote, one person. And, um, and even the pushback in, in Georgia against a recount in January um, is also that, and I, I, I'm gonna pause here just to make a shout out to Stacey Abrams, who I think is the superhero of, <laughs> of this whole election series. Um, and so I, you know, I, I, I really feel that it's criminal the ways in which voted representatives in this country are trying to delegitimize our democracy by one, suppressing the vote, two, preventing counts, and now three, endorsing legal challenges against them. I, you know, that is very sad. And I also am kind of a little bit um, frightened about how fragile the institution of a democracy is. Um, we came to the brink of, of, of being citizens of a fascist state and, and um, are still fighting to get our democracy back. Yeah, and uh, democracy cannot be taken for granted at all, um, yeah. Let's talk about your latest book, Claudia, Just Us. You know, at its core, it's about the necessary conversations we must have about whiteness. And it's about the fictions that we tell ourselves. But before we actually dive into it, I, I would like you to tell us a little bit about the title. So it's taken from the punchline of a Richard Pryor skit. And I, if I'm not mistaken, you have that little Excellent. You, why don't I play it for you? Mm. I went to jail for income tax evasion, right? You know, I didn't know a motherfucking thing about no taxes. I told the judge, said, Your Honor, I forgot. You know, he said, You remember next year, nigga? Start writing on your ass. Oh, they give niggas time like it's lunch down there. <laughs> you go down there looking for justice. That's what you find. Just us. So that it's actually the reverse. The um, epitaph and the use of the Richard Pryor came after the title. I, I had the title and the artist Alexandra Bell said, are you taking this from Richard Pryor? Mm. And um, so then, um, you know, I love her work, the counter narratives that she does um, and the, the way in which she's brought back um, an examination of the media. But in any case, she um, pointed me to that. And when I looked at it, I was fascinated because obviously the just us when used by prior means black people. But I also love the fact that when you think about justice, it could also mean that justice is only for white people. Hmm. And, um, 
so that there was a kind of slipperiness in the use of the collision of just us with justice. Mm -hmm. And um, so it seemed um, the right epigraph to enter this book because this is a book that tries to say, you cannot talk about racism without talking about white people. You cannot talk about anti-black racism without talking about white people and about the institutions of whiteness and the, the continued um, ingrained white supremacist orientation in which um, this country, on which this country was founded. So that's how that happened. Mm. I mean, it's, it's a brilliant title. And I'll say for me, um, you know, the, the play on the word justice um, and almost that the book title can be read as just us. <laughs> <laughs> are we the only, you know, um, so I read it that way. Um, and also, you know, I, I, justice, I, I had the um, incredible honor of uh, going to Toni Morrison's home a few years ago and, and interviewing her. And she was working on a novel at the, that time, and I hope it comes out, and the working title was Justice. Um, so there, there are just so many resonances um, to your particular title. So. You know, and I also just want to talk for a moment about humor as well. The power of humor, and you draw on humor at different points in the book and in, in, in previous works. Humor can often say things that's just hard to tell, to say straight up, that that is the power of humor. Um, that said, there's a lot, there's not a ton of humor in your new book. A lot of it is very, very serious. And needs to be serious. I think um, it's funny in times, but okay. <laughs> but not all, more, more not funny. <laughs> I know, by virtue of, of reality, it's sometimes not funny. So, um, Claudia, if I may, I'm going to read just a little tiny bit from the beginning, towards the beginning, when you talk about um, what you've set out to do with this book, um, at least one aspect of it. Uh, so this is on page, 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 page 19. The running comment in our current political climate is that we all need to converse with people we don't normally speak to. And though my husband is white, I found myself falling into easy banter with all kinds of strangers except white men. They rarely sought me out to shoot the breeze and I did not seek them out. Maybe it was time to engage, even if my fantasies of these encounters seemed outlandish. I wanted to try. So, Claudia, tell us a little bit about, about these conversations, some of the things that you learned, maybe some of the things that surprised you. I think, um, you know, I was watching my students um, interview all kinds of people, their family members, and I thought, you know, maybe I should try that. And, and I was thinking, I, I'm one of those people, maybe everybody is one of those people who are constantly trying to figure out how to do a lot of things at once. <laughs> and so I thought, you know, when I'm waiting for the plane, it's kind of dead time. And I'm usually surrounded by white men um, traveling in either first class or business class. And um, so why don't I use that time to try and talk to them about their privilege, about their understanding of whiteness. And so what I learned um, is that that phrase white privilege, and it's interesting to me that it's a phrase that was developed by white people to talk about um, privilege, is a, a term that makes um, white men think that I wanna talk about their economic privilege. Mm. And, and I, I, I hadn't gone into those conversations thinking I was always gonna get a bootstrap narrative about how hard they worked or sometimes every once in a while, there would be a guy who was like, I have a lot of money and I've always had a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and it's good to be me, but uh, <laughs> but most most of the time it was you know 
um, people who worked hard, and I, I could see that they worked hard. They were falling asleep on these long flights, um, and they were surrounded by computers and papers and phone calls and all of that stuff that we um, spend our day doing. And so I began to stop using that term white privilege and started asking them about their white living. Like, mm -hmm. what does it feel like just to be a white man moving around in space? Because I, I got tired of the having to say, I'm not talking about money. I'm not talking about economic privilege. I just want you to tell me how it feels not to be policed, to be racially profiled, to have movement where you're not questioned, where a door opens and people assume you're going to walk into it. I cannot tell you how many times with my husband, he will walk into places he's not even invited into and they allow him in and expect him. And then when I follow, they're like, what are you doing here? <laughs> Can we help you? Who are you? Um, so that kind of mobility is a thing to watch in, in the world. So that's that that would be the major thing I learned, I think. I mean, what you just said about the different um, responses to you and your husband reminds me of something. I don't know if it's something I've heard you say or if it was actually in the book about a moment when you had left the house and you'd forgotten to turn off. The alarm went off or something and, and you mm -hmm. arrived at your house and the, the police were called. Perhaps you can tell that story. Well, this happened not long ago, actually. <laughs> But I, I think I was distracted and I left the house to walk the dog. And the way our alarm works, um, if you don't disengage it, um, it will go off if you're opening the wrong doors. And so I just locked the door behind me and took the dog. And when I came back, there were all these policemen in our yard and because the alarm had triggered. And, um, and so I come up and and I say to the guy who approaches me, oh my God, I, you know, I accidentally did this. Let me go inside and turn it off. And, and we have a code, you have to put the code in to get in the house. Then you have to go put in another code to turn the alarm off. All these things are happening. And um, then I come back outside and, and we're sort of joking about this and that. And my husband has gotten a notification on his phone as well saying the alarm is off. So he gets in his car and drives home and jumps out of the car and comes bounding down the steps. And the policeman turns to him and says, she said she lives here. <laughs> Even before like, who are you or can we help you? Or do you know this man? <laughs> she said it was like, it was like a kid had been caught fraternizing with the Nazis or something, you know? <laughs> it was just like, she said, she lives here. And, um, and those moments are, those are the kinds of moments that are always to me revealing of how just below the surface of civility lives anti-blackness in white mm. people mm. and and it shows itself just like that in mm -hmm. in a random moment mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i mean you know claudia this is a very brave and courageous book and it's a book that is worth reading quite slowly um, i'm going to come to the form of the book in, in a moment um, but one of the things that really sort of spoke to me was just how many times you shine a light on sort of the fictions that we that we weave and, and what we want to believe but actually doesn't compute with reality and there's there's just example after example um, and also just you know I talk about you being brave and courageous because you are sort of breaking that social contract and there's a chapter entitled social contract sort of the unwritten code that one doesn't talk about race, um, but you, you go right there and you use the term white and white privilege and, you know, these, you know, terms and encounters that make people feel uncomfortable. Almost, there's almost, I feel sometimes in society, society a desire to feel, oh, we, we're beyond this. We've, we've moved past this and we haven't at all. And I wanted to highlight another conversation. I mean, there's so many conversations, which is why everyone should just buy the book and read it. But um, 
there's an example, there was a, a, a cross burning at, um, back when you were at college some years ago. Um, and you spoke to a friend who actually, who, who actually saw this. And as the friend was, was recounting the event, the, the friend then talked about the people that were behind it and, and, and what, how she wondered about what they were doing right now. Perhaps you can, that was sort of a very long-winded <laughs> way of introducing it, but you can talk about <laughs> it. It's funny, but um, um, that very friend is actually in California right now. So I'm like, are you out there? Um, we, I, I um, in that conversation, I, I was thinking about who would remember among my friend group. And it was surprising to me when I approached this friend that she actually was the one who saw it and called the police or called the campus police. And, and they brought her into, I think a basement and she had to go through pictures of um, people. And, and so when she wrote, when I said, do you wanna write your memory of it? She wrote, um, I wonder, if the people, the students, the possible students who did this are looking back and regret that they had behaved in such a way. And, and it just reminded me of how quickly white people want to believe in the benevolence of white people. How, you know, uh, if you look at this election, for example, how disappointed people were that it wasn't a landslide election that in fact it was so close i mean you know biden has pulled away in many states but we still have a lot of people many people who voted and so um so that was surprising to me i you know i i and i said to to her you know why would you think that they're any different today than they were then. And, and one of the things she said to me recently, we, you know, cause we talk pretty often, she said, you know, the other thing I only recently thought about is why did they show me those students? So that must mean that they had done other things to be people of interest in that moment. And when I received the police files, because I requested the police files that existed, um, they named two students, two white male students. And when I looked them up, kind of to my horror, they were both in the justice system now. One was an attorney general and one um, um, was a judge. And so I, I just, um, you know, hopefully they had a big transformation or something, <laughs> but given the way the um, justice system has worked out for, um, as, as um, Richard Pryor told us, um, I wouldn't be surprised if they hold the same beliefs today that they held when, you know, we were 18, 19, 20. Mm -hmm. I mean, this business of, you know, wanting to believe in the benevolence of people. I mean, it, it's not just white people, but I, as a black person, I, I want to always want to believe. We always want to believe in the best. Um, but sometimes we just have to look at facts and this, this facts in this era where, where facts are always questioned. And this comes to the form of, of your book. Um, you know, I will say for one, um, one thing that really struck me was looking at, you have a little graph uh, towards the end of the book, which shows the percentages of people that voted for President Obama the first time round and the second time round. And one thing that I hear in conversation now is, oh, how can we be where we are when everyone was behind uh, President Obama? And President Obama never got, the highest was like 43% of the white vote. And just that pure, and then, you know, the second time round, it was like 39. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, there's some things that we either conveniently forget or we don't want to look at um, for what they are. Um, but let's let's talk about the form, Claudia. You're, there's just great hybridity in your work. You draw on images, you draw on video, film, um, and just even in this book, you have kind of like a narrative on the right-hand side, and then on the verso, you have um, photographs, evidence, be it anecdotal or factual, 
and tell us a little bit about what went into the form of this book. Well, I, you know, part of um, my practice is that the content and form have to be married for me to be happy in the process of making the book, that the two things really have to be working um, in tandem. And so for this book, I was interested in the ways in which fake news, anti-science, anti-facts have um, taken the day during the Trump administration. And so I, I wanted the book to reinsert um, factual information into quotidian conversations, into ordinariness comes the facts, along with the, the tweets and along with um, a kind of image database that, that um, I think we all have associatively. So the question was, how do I then organize it so that it's not sort of in the back of the book as often happens? And I came up with a system where the, the essays would run on the recto side of the page and the, um, the conversational facts and information would be on the verso side of the page. And then how do you get people to go to those? We came up with a red dot so that if a sentence sort of butterflied out into um, other kinds of referential moments that would either destabilize the statement or confirm the statement, those facts, those images ended up on the verso side of the page. So that, and, and I wanted the text to be an open text so that as a reader, if you didn't wanna read that, you didn't have to. If you wanted to read it and then think about it, then you could, you know, so it, it sort of inserted a kind of um, autonomy into the act of reading. So Claudia, I just want to spend a minute or two talking about perhaps some of the blind spots that you found that you realized that you had in going about doing what you did. I mean, I'm thinking in particular a uh, chapter uh, entitled Jose Marti. Um, and in addition, there, there is one question that I, I don't ever do this, but I'm doing this because Carol Sisherman has come to every single event and she's asked a question, wouldn't interviewing white men in airports eliminate white men who earn much less and might feel differently about their own well-being? Uh, that sort of touches on privilege um, and also perhaps your own privilege as someone who is able to, first of all, fly at least pre-COVID um, business class and so forth. So maybe those two things, you know, what you had learned about your own blind spots and yeah, well, yeah. the thing was, um, I wouldn't consider that a blind spot in the sense that it was intentional. I thought I was going to show up in this book in my world. I wasn't going to pretend to have a kind of um, a neutral position when I didn't, that I wanted to, to, to show the positionality from which I was speaking. And... Um, and so that the precarities that I have are not ones that are necessarily based on financial issues. Um, not that those are not important, but in this book, it was a real, you know, I normally, I don't show up in my books in a, in a way that's fully me, you know, and, um, but I wanted this book to do that. Um, the, the using business class, um, you know, I, that's what it looks like for me because I'm traveling for work and they're traveling for work. One, I did hear from other white men in different economic um, positions. It was when the piece ran in the New York Times. Then I received over 200 letters and real letters, like pages and pages in, in my email. And those were from everybody, um, both very um, wealthy people and also very poor people. Some of them to tell me that they were very poor people and, and, and therefore I wasn't taking them into account. So I, I, I didn't really um, 
the blind spots I did have were more in, I think my, my sense of building a referential world around anti-blackness without taking into account the, the diversity of say Latinx. So sort of living under the bell umbrella of women of, um, women of color and people of color as if that's one thing, mm. you know? And, um, and so it was good to understand um, or to be called to task about speaking about Latinx as if it was one thing or speaking about the Asian community as if they're one thing or speaking about the black community as if it's one thing. Um, um, though anti-blackness happens to people despite their economic situation or um, education, where they live, whatever. This, this, this is the one category where it doesn't matter if you're President Obama or me, you know, you're still gonna get the same kind of dismissal from um, white people who centralize their own existence over the existence of any, anyone else. Hmm. You use the word precarity, which is a word that you use in the book, and I hear you use a lot as you're speaking, and also the word swerve. It's interesting, actually, swerve is a word that I really associate with Michelle Obama. She uses it a lot in Becoming, how she swerves to sort of, you know, do something that maybe she ordinarily wouldn't do in sort of a confidence thing. Um, but talk to us about swerve and your use of the word swerve in this book? Well, um, I think one of the things that I have run into over the years, and I don't know if it's an age thing or, um, or, you know, I don't know exactly, or I'm not understanding something, which is also possible. Um, but I've always felt that part of being human is to adjust to the person in front of you. And that for some people, in, um, in this case, white people, that one has to swerve in order to negotiate and bear some of what comes at you. And, um, and and I've had the experience um, most recently, I think, with um, the white card, a play that I did, where we were trying to um, cast the black female actress. And we brought in um, some very um, well-known but younger um, black actresses. And they kept saying, I don't understand why this character would stay in the room with a white person who is racist. And I say, well, don't you swerve in your own life? Don't you adjust because you want to stay in that room because you want to do the thing you want to do? And they kept saying to me, I would just walk out. And I was like, you would walk out? I have never seen anybody walk, just get up. I mean, on occasion in fits of anger, but, but mostly, in business meetings, people, you see people adjusting, you, you see people trying to change the direction, but, but this, you know, so the swerve to me is an active negotiation of, of real life life, um, as opposed to a dogmatic, I'm out of here. And so it, it to me is a re useful thing. So is that possibility of the swerve what gives you hope? Well, I think it's an it's, it's kind of an accommodation in the sense of one wants to be able to negotiate a life. Mm -hmm. What gives me hope is that it will become less necessary in regards to um, anti-blackness in this country. 
um, I don't think it will ever disappear, but I think we now have a public that's much more um, literate around and educated around some of these issues. And so it's, I don't, I don't feel like I necessarily am the one who has to bring certain things up when they're occurring. Other people are speaking to those moments. I don't have to get out of the way of um, a weaponized um, insult. Other people are, are jumping in to say no to that. Um, so then the swerve is less necessary because somehow the environment is, um, is, is, is addressing those moments. But, you know, but we also have this very new and weird dynamic where people are being very racist in their attempts to be anti-racist. Say more. Um, well, I, I have found that um, a lot of people now, I've been getting students telling me and people telling me that they're getting calls, for example, saying, um, we have, a, we have the perfect job for you and it would have been yours except that we are being forced to hire a black person. And, you know, so that language is now becoming more and more acceptable. Like we, nobody says we have, we have realized that our institution is all white and therefore can only represent one perspective. Um, but instead they're being forced to, to do anti-racist work. <laughs> and, and sorry, you white person, we would have, we would, you would be here, but we're gonna have to, you know, it's kind of in a way what Amy Kobachar did. You remember she said, I, I am going to step aside um, for, for consideration of VP so that um, Biden can, can get a woman of color, get a, you know, a black woman in there. And in fact, she was stepping aside because of what was going on in, in Minneapolis and in, in Minnesota, her state where policing was out of control. Mm -hmm. But that this new way of, of acting like um, they're doing a favor to, to black people. It's another sort of fiction making. Mm -hmm. um, Should we look at Situation 11? Sure, sure, sure. Speaking of Amy Covey, <coughs> at one point she was in there, actually. Um, Perhaps you can just set that up. Um, okay. Um, so I, I, I was often asked, um, what's a conversation that would have been in just us had the pub date been um, later? And and the one conversation that happened was between Christian Cooper and Sarah Cooper in Central Park around putting her dog on a leash. And after that conversation and what happened, a lot of people said to me, um, friends of mine, you know, white friends of mine said, oh my God, that Amy Cooper is racist, but should she have lost her job? Isn't that going a little too far? Isn't that too much? And and it was that moment, you know, when every time those moments happen, I'm like, what? <laughs> you too at Brutus? <laughs> I went to jail for income tax. I went to jail. Oh, sorry. It's all the way at the end of the... Um... I mean, just as you're scrolling through, this is um, just so the power of the images that you use and even just the, the cover, um, you know, that's something we could talk about, but um, let's see the situation. Okay, here it goes. Okay. There is an African-American man I am in second part. He is recording me and threatening myself and my dog. Amy Cooper calls the police on a black man bird watching. Hers 
was a quotidian reminder, reminder of the normalcy of, how can I put it, having not been men to survive. Christian Cooper, no apparent relation, asked Amy Cooper to put her dog on a leash. It was a simple ask in accordance with the rules of Central Park's ramble. I am enthralled with Cooper's affect, her plaintive 911 call of distress, I'm gonna tell them there's an African -American man intensified my with each repetition of the phrase, I am being threatened. And there's a man, African -American I am being like, threatened. He's recording me and threatening By the me third repetition, her voice there's quivers. But she's able to multitask and we attach the leash to the dog as she speaks. Like an actor heightening her fear in her performance of a line, she pushes on. I am being threatened. Cooper and I both recognize she can bet on racism, racial profiling, and possible unwarranted murder of a black person to be supported systemically by random policemen, prosecutors, judges, and the carceral system at large. Our mutual socialization into repeated patterns of discrimination allows her to do what she does and prepares me to understand what she is doing in the daylight of what I am seeing. Where we part company, where we part, where I am no longer a part, is in her expectation that I will agree that she is afraid. Do fantasies create real emotions? Is Christian Cooper's possible death an acceptable loss? History says, yes. Yesterday said, yes. If fantasies are relevant to the moment, are they not also relevant to the consequences of the moment. Can I categorize Amy Cooper's behavior as an American story that plays fast and loose with notions of imagined fear? To imagine herself as a rescue, to imagine herself into a rescue narrative is to activate a covert white female power trigger that can easily call in the violence of white men. One white friend puts it this way. Amy Cooper assumed her role as a piece of high value white property in jeopardy, tapping into what she knows to be a salient catalyst for swift and deadly intervention. Given this, is her performance more incredulous rage than fear? The rules, the rules don't apply to her. Am I to understand her as thinking or is it feeling the fullness of, don't you see who I am? Is that white living right below, just below a level of civility? Spoken, I believe, rage tied to white identities assumes sense of ownership of all property. Her park, her city, her apartment building, her, her Friends. Her president, her president. And why you're here. Cooper's exact words were, I'm going to tell them there's an African-American man threatening my life. Hers is the language of good manners, weaponizing the narratives of white racism. Excuse me. 
she says to Christian Cooper as she dies the police. There are so many Amy Coopers, women like Lucy Foreman Hartley, the white woman who served as justification for the Tulsa massacre, the white woman behind the Rosewood massacre, the two white women behind the imprisonment of the Scottsboro boys, Carolyn Bryant Dunham, who finally admitted to lying but whose admittance could not bring back to life Emmett Till. Or Linda Fierstein, who prosecuted the Central Park jogger case and willfully sent five Black and Latinx teenagers to prison for years. For years on false and suppressed evidence. Do I need to go on? The various modes of behavior that white women weaponize in service of black death are there to be metabolized. It's an old script supported by this one. Yeah. yeah, it's it's an old script, and um, yeah, I, 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 these are things we have to look at and have conversations about as uncomfortable as they are. And I just had a glance in the chat and I can see there's, there's a little chat back and forth um, around the notion of, you know, what does, what are people doing unconsciously or consciously? Um, and I think, again, I just want to reiterate just how brave and courageous uh, you have been in giving us all of your works and in really just looking, just looking at what the facts are and not, and not, and not swerving away. <laughs> um, and just thank you for that. And I really encourage everyone to, to read your work and, and think about it. Um, Claudia, this is not easy work. Tell me what, this is not easy work and these are not easy times. What grounds you? in these um, times? Well, I think, you know, Sarah, I can ask you what grounds you. Okay, I, mean, I asked you, I asked first. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I think um, one of the most disappointing things is for me is when people think I do the work that I do um, to cash in, you know, to, to when in fact, I would not be doing this work. There, there are easier ways to, if, if you want to um, build an audience or whatever. Um, but I, you know, I, I have a daughter and it sounds corny, but it's true. You want this world, you want to leave the world a better place than you found it. And you, and for me, the only way I know how to do that is by writing and is by um, doing the kind of hybrid work that I do that looks closely at um, people. And, you know, I just watched Dave Chappelle the other day and he said, he said, that he was not as optimistic as Donald Trump because Donald Trump says there are good people on all sides and he thinks there are bad people on all sides. <laughs> and, um, and, and I agree with that. We are complex people, but, but we live inside a structure that was built on white supremacy. And um, so this culture of whiteness has caused so much damage. And we have managed by looking only 
at um, black people, or only at poor black people, or only at to somehow divorce white people from the equation. So we've managed to go 400 years and where um, people talk about what's happening without talking about the role that white people, ordinary white people are playing in it every day. And, and so, and, and I, the only person I know really who did that work is Baldwin, mm. who kept saying, you know, you got to, you got to understand that this problem is not about black people. Mm. This is a problem that is perpetuated by white people and their fantasies. Um, so I, I, I just, I'm taking his cue and continuing that kind of um, investigation. And, um, you know, if it does some good, great. Claudia, thank you. Um, I'm going to just round out with three quick questions that we like to ask. We're going to go over a few minutes of just heads up, but I, I knew this would be the case. Uh, we can't cut you short. Um, if you could change anything about the way that people think of the African diaspora, what would it be? Well, I think it's this notion again of um, that it's the place of need rather than a vibrant, cultural, productive place that is part of the world and the world has many problems and those places have many problems. But, but we are also part of everything that is vibrant and contributing. And, um, but again and again, you have both um, people of color and white people constantly presenting it as a place of need. And I think that kind of feeds into a kind of um, disproportionate um, centralizing of the power of whiteness and, and, um, and the ways in which white people can show up to help black people out when in fact, they're showing up to cause the problems. You know, countries that are devastated um, are devastated because their resources were taken. They're not devastated because they're devastated. So to that point, in terms of celebrating all that is amazing, um, talk to us about your, I know this is an impossible question, your favorite artist from the African diaspora and also perhaps someone that you feel is not, should be recognized more. Hmm. John Acumpra is somebody whose work I adore and, and often I find that people don't know who he is. Um, and the, the films that he does are, I think, um, incredible. I also am really um, interested right now um, in author Jaffa's relationship, um, AJ's relationship to John Acumber's work, like, because in, in some ways they're doing a very similar thing in bringing the history um, up against the ordinary, um, the high meets the low, the, you know, all of it into one genre, into one um, art form of excellence. Mm -hmm. So I, I, would, I would say John Acumber. Great. You asked me what grounds me. One of the things that grounds me are these conversations that are so vital and important. And I really do believe, I really believe personally that we move, we, even if it's just inching forward, we do move forward with these kinds of conversations. Um, I brought us almost up to time, but I, we, have, we always have spectacular guests and I hope that they are all still with us. Um, I, I've, uh, most of those, who I have chosen for today are poets and they come from every corner of the world. Um, so if Elizabeth, you can kindly pull up Romy, who is based in England and Romy is a, 
a poet, a performer, a playwright. And uh, then we have Remy, who is based, who is a Rwandan, based in Namibia. And then we have you two. And I think Romeo Oriogun, who is from Nigeria, who's a poet. I don't know if he's here. And Lika, who is a poet from, um, an amazing poet and novelist from Holland. So thank you so much. I don't know, maybe Romeo will join us later, but um, yes, let's start with you, Romeo. Well, uh, thank you so much, Sarah and Claudia, for the conversation this evening, which is so enriching to experience, particularly when we are, when travel, physical travel is curtailed in the way that it typically is to be able to travel in the way that we have this evening, I think, um, cerebrally. And it kind of brings me to the question that I want to ask. Um, I have this um, wonderful book and you signed it for me when I was stood in the queue to congratulate you on winning the forward back in September 2015 at the Royal Festival Hall and you signed it for me and um, I said as I said my thank yous I joined a queue of predominantly black people but also within that black women who were queuing to thank you for finding I uh, it was finding a language I go back to um Audrey Lord's articulation that poetry is the way that we give name to the nameless so that it can be thought. There's something here in this book that's about giving name to thought so that it can be affirmed. And so much of your work seems to be for me about taking up space and making something that has often been swept under the carpet visible. So I wonder if you can talk about, particularly with regard to um, the Racial Imaginary Institute, the ways in which you take up space as a method, methodology. That seems to me to join so many, many aspects of your work. Is that intentional? Thank you, Romy, for your um, question. And also, I, I, I was watching you um, perform. And I was thinking you have the most incredible range in terms okay. of your vocal ability to take up space. So, so I think we do much of the same thing. I, you know, I, I, somebody said to me recently that my work is tactical and I would not have used that word, but um, I, I, I understand um, what he meant by it, that I do, I do feel that we have to aggressively create a counter narrative to the stories that have been told um, and that somehow proliferate the landscape um, when in fact there's so many other um, more true ways of seeing things. And so the Racial Imaginary Institute was an attempt to, um, to put in the spotlight um, artists and works that are involved in a kind of counter narrative around the dominant narratives that are out there. So um, somebody like Alexandra Bell, um, her work and, and a lot of different writers, um, Dave Chappelle, if we could get the rights to his, um, even his Saturday Night Live performance last week, that's the kind of thing that it, I wanted it to become an archive where we could all go and see work that actually tells the life that we understand and know, rather than ones that give us a version of white benevolence um, in, in the face of white violence. Thank, thank you so much, Claudia and Romy. Um, let's go to um, Remy. Tell us what time it is where you are once you unmute yourself. Thank you. It is currently 11 o'clock at night. So on a Friday, I canceled everything to be at this conversation. <laughs> We're on it. <laughs> Which is and tell us, tell us where you are. I live in Vintuk in Namibia. Uh, there's not much happening, so there wasn't much to cancel. 
Uh, you see, you got cancelled because you made it sound <laughs> as if there wasn't much to cancel for this. Remy, you're frozen. So let's see if you can unfreeze. The challenges of uh, connectivity. Yes. Uh, Remy, while you're trying to unfreeze, you, you did warn me that this might happen. Um, and so I think you had sent in a question. Let me just scroll through to see if I can find what you sent in. Uh, okay. Okay, Remy, does, does literature offer the immigrant writer a more welcoming, diverse and permanent citizenship than the legal concept? Um, that's a really great question. And I think, um, our fantasies about what writing and what literature gives us versus what could be our realities, um, is I think a tug of war that happens. And one of the things that we saw recently with Donald Trump is that he was trying to um, defund institutions that taught certain work. Um, and I know this because my work was on the list of things that was no longer um, part of um, the Make America Great Again um, curriculum. And, um, so I, th I think we can't take for granted literature and the space of literature and writing and reading as a democratic space. It's, it's a real privilege to be able to write what we want, to have it published and to have it out there. And um, there are many countries where we don't have that privilege. And in the United States now, I think at um, public institutions, they are, constantly under threat given a certain, um, given what is being taught in the classrooms. So, and I, I think we'll see more and more of that in states that are under Republican leadership. Claudia, thank you. And thank you for giving us these extra few minutes. Um, we're going to round out now with one of my favorite poets. Lika from Amsterdam. Lika, are you, are you there? Yeah. yeah. Is it working? <laughs> it is yeah. working. Yeah. Okay. This is, I managed to go uh, through the entire pandemic without doing a single Zoom meeting. So this is, I must be the only one um, who has never done this before. I just wanna, I don't really have a question. I just wanted to say thank you so much for this um, super interesting conversation. And um, Claudia, I, I really admire your work. And it was actually Sarah who introduced me to it. So this is, um, uh, well, it's been really great to um, get to listen to uh, the two of you. And um, yeah, just, well, both of you are of great influence to me. So thank you for that. Thank you again. And I hope you're doing well. I know you've had some challenges in, in the recent times. Yeah, uh, oh, thank you so much. Thank you. And I've had some too, and you make it through. You make it through. Okay, thanks. That's great to hear. Thank you so much. Uh, we all wish this, that this could, would never end, but alas, it has to. Claudia, thank you so much. Um, this has just been such, such an amazing thing for all of us. And I see that some people have been asking in the questions, you know, can we see the images? Can we see videos? I would encourage everyone to go to Claudia's uh, website and get her book. All the images are in there, get her books. And um, yeah, just really enjoy them. We have an exciting guest coming up for December, which Elizabeth will tell you about. And um, again, just really want to thank you, Claudia, and thank all of you in the audience, too. So over to Elizabeth. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you, Claudia. 
for this afternoon's conversation. It's so enlightening and I love hearing both of you speak about all of the topics. Um, and I do also, along with Sarah, recommend that everyone buy Claudia's book and, and read it. It's very profound and, and really moving and impactful. So um, treat yourself. I'm gonna share my screen again and um, tell you about what's coming up. We're very excited that our uh, December conversations across the diaspora will be with the U.S. Senator Cory Booker. It is scheduled for December 11th um, at the same time, 12 noon uh, Pacific time. Because of his very busy and complicated schedule, um, we actually aren't allowed to advertise or officially confirm the date until three weeks prior. Um, so that gives us about a week before it will be up on our website and we can definitely confirm that, that he will be our guest on that date. It will certainly happen, but that date will be um, official in a week. So check back at um, the MOAD calendar to um, find out how to register and confirm that that's when it will be. I do want to take another moment to thank Peggy Woodford Forbes for supporting Conversations Across the Diaspora, this wonderful series that we've started, Sarah and I, together during the pandemic and um, has had a wonderful life here at MOAD and we will continue. I want to thank Litquake for being our partner today in this program and poets and writers for supporting us as well. And uh, of course, I would love for everyone here, if you have um, any extra change in your pocket to support MOAD um, by donating, you can text the number 56512 and type in the word MOAD SF, follow the link to make a donation. And we would also love to get your feedback on today's program. So we have a survey. Um, I put that in the chat, but you can also if you have your phone handy, you can take a picture of this QR code and uh, it will pull up the survey for you. I think it will also appear at the end once you close your Zoom, but I never know if that kind of technology actually works. So cover your bases and um, take a picture or, uh, or use the link in the chat. But thank you all very much again for being here today for sharing your wisdom with all of us here at MOAD. And we look forward to the next time with Cory Booker. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you both.